Howdy, everybody. Come on. Hi, hi. And hi online. I'm Tim. If you don't know me online, hi. We're in week three. We're going through the, uh, the parables, uh, going through that. And, and my good friend D up front just uh, said to me right before we went live, that, uh, that she has, isn't familiar with this parable. And that's actually what, 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 you know what, I don't know, if we, would anyone be willing to share? You good? You good? All right, awesome, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I made an error in not remembering to print an extra copy or two today, so... And I said that last week, didn't I? Because we were running short on them. Um, all right, so we are, uh, we are in week three going through the parables. And this parable is one that people aren't that familiar with, which is why we put it in the third week. Because we're kind of doing one of the most, if not the most familiar parables in the last week. Which also is interesting because we're taking them out of order. Because this parable occurs after said most famous parable. And uh, we put it here because it's less familiar. And so it's kind of something we can dig into. And it's not as fun if we put that one last. And people are like, well, that's a weird parable to end the, the uh, seminar in. And then uh, the second reason is, is because talking about this parable actually can help us with context for that last one that we'll look at, which... Uh, occurs in uh, chapter 15, which is the one that we call the parable of the prodigal son. Although we're going to talk about why we might want to go with a bit of a different name for that one next week, but that's a preview for next week. So plan on tuning in or coming back next week for that one. But this one's fun too, actually. It's called uh, The Parable of the Shrewd Manager, although we have these titles that show up in our Bibles or that we're accustomed to using, and uh, Luke, for instance, did not call this parable The Parable of the Shrewd Man Manager, nor did Jesus say, hey, I'm going to tell you The Parable of the Shrewd Manager one day. It's just a title that we've come up with in our headers and our Bibles uh, to give a summary statement about what the details of the narrative uh, story that Jesus is going to tell are. And so, with this parable, um, Jesus actually tells this parable in, in a sequence of parables in response to his audience in a way that gets after the, uh, the Pharisees and scribes and the people that he tends to be at opposition with. And this parable ends up being the one that is the straw that broke the camel's back in this particular sequence where he is getting after the religious elites. This is the one that after they hear this one, uh, we find out from Luke and I'll read this to you because we don't have it in here because we just put the parable itself in here. But Luke says that after this parable, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and scoffed at him being Jesus. Now that's interesting because I want you to catch something. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this. And you're thinking, all this, what does that mean? Well, it's actually not just talking about this parable. The parable of the prodigal son and the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin that come before also turn out to agitate the Pharisees as well. Which is why we put this one first, and next week when we look at the, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, it'll help us with the context for that one, because that's one of those parables we've heard so many times, we know it even in our larger culture, that we think we know it. But we will challenge that assumption next week. So with this one, this is a parable about uh, someone that Jesus tells a story about that uh, effectively acts shrewdly and is commended for it. Um, and the interesting about, thing about this parable is that, well, on one hand, the person's being incredibly dishonest, and you would think Jesus wouldn't tell a story about someone being dishonest 
and being uh, labeled as commendable. Lo and behold, Jesus does. So that ought to shock us a little bit. Um, and then recognizing the context of the parable will help us to understand it. So I'm going to go ahead and read this parable because unlike in, in, the, in, uh, in part two when we did the parable uh, of the soils and whatnot, and there were multiple ones, and we kind of compared and contrasted, I'm going to read this uh, entire one here. And then we'll talk about it. We've got, if you remember last week, and they're in the, in the material here, we've got our questions that we went through last week, and we're going to do that again because uh, if you're, uh, you know, if, if you don't recall or, or, or what have you, um, our goal is to look at this parable within um, the context that we established in week one, talking about the nature of parables, uh, the why, the what, the when, how, and then um, figuring out what it means from that point. So this is what Luke says uh, that Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 16, verse 1 through 13. It says, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. You can see the scheming going on here. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters, Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay, so Jesus tells the parable, and then rather than getting a, an explanation of the parable, Jesus teaches off of the parable. Now you might be thinking, well, what's the difference in explaining? Well, Jesus didn't stop and say, this is the meaning of the parable, uh, the uh, the, the manager represents this, and every time he uh, acted this way with the first uh, debtor and the second debtor, this represents that. Jesus instead makes a point about uh, the parable that he's just told, and then goes on to elaborate on that point. And then after that, which again is in our notes here, Uh, goes on and Luke says, comments, that the Pharisees who love money heard all this, including this last parable, and they scoffed at Jesus. So what might Jesus be doing with this rather weird parable that many of us uh, haven't thought about very often because, you know, we know about the parable of the seed and soils, and we know about the prodigal son parable, Mm, the parable of the shrewd manager, you know, this, well, that's okay, but many people really don't. Uh, we, and it's, it's okay uh, because it's not, you know, it's not one of those ones that we come across very often. So here's, here's uh, what we want to consider. So good, getting to our questions that we had, the first one is what were the surrounding circumstances that led to Jesus using this particular parable? Well, in Luke 14, 25 through 16, 31, which is the the section of passages that this parable comes in, 
Jesus is teaching a large crowd consisting of a variety of different people. Included in that crowd are tax collectors and sinners, and yet also Pharisees and scribes. And of course, Jesus' disciples are always right around Jesus, listening to his teaching and whatnot. And his overall theme in this whole section is the cost of discipleship. Jesus is uh, constantly telling his disciples uh, that, you know, being a follower of mine is not going to be easy. There's going to be a cost to it, uh, a cost of comfort, uh, a cost of well-being, and maybe even a cost of life. But Jesus eventually, in teaching these parables, as is always the case, ends up getting into it with the Pharisees who have disagreements about what he's teaching. And so he ends up in a string of parables that effectively uh, go after their points of contention with him. Uh, it's, his way of, it's his way of not necessarily even winning an argument, but trying to show them a different way, trying to challenge their thoughts, trying to challenge uh, the ways in which they're challenging him. And so the parable that comes before the shrewd ma manager parable, which again we put out of order and we'll look at next week, imply that the cost of discipleship might come with including people who we might not think belong in God's kingdom. Hence the reason that Jesus will tell parables about lost things, including lost sons. But in this case, uh, Jesus ups the ante on this idea about including people, and he kind of takes a turn and challenges the Pharisees about their motive with this parable. And so we have to ask the next question, which is how might Jesus' audience have responded to uh, this, this parable? And as we know from Luke's gospel, if you read uh, the Luke's gospel, the Pharisees are often agitated uh, at Jesus' teachings, and he, they're especially agitated uh, by the parables of the lost things and the shrewd manager. Luke says so in verse 14. We just read it a couple of times. We're not told, though, what the rest of the crowd thinks, necessarily. So if you can imagine, it's like Luke has painted a picture of a large crowd around Jesus, and he's teaching the crowd these things, but then he hones in, and Luke's story, and bringing our attention into it, hones in on the Pharisees. And they're the ones that we get uh, the feedback from in terms of, of what their response is, and it's obviously not favorable, or they wouldn't be scoffing at Jesus. So, because of that, we have to somewhat play a guessing game on the larger um, on the larger crowd that would have been listening to, since we know the crowd goes beyond the Pharisees. And we talked a little bit last week about the ways that we can make educated guesses at what might have been thought based off of the recognition that A, parables are always rooted in reality, and yet there's also uh, some element of the parable to try to pull uh, the listener in that's seemingly outrageous. And this parable, no doubt, has some outrageousness because Jesus, oddly, is using uh, a story about someone that's doing something dishonest and using it as an example for how people ought to act, which is head-scratching a little bit. And so people might have welcomed these stories, hearing them. Uh, they might have seen themselves in the stories that Jesus is telling, uh, both in the parables of lost things and even in the shrewd manager story. They might know what it's like to be in a situation where you don't know what to do and you've got to try to be crafty and, and, and make something uh, out of a bad situation, which this person no doubt does, even if the way they go about it is questionable. And so, uh, but yet at the same time, some of them might have been equally agitated by Jesus as the Pharisees were because, and this is key, the people might have aspired to, to be like the Pharisees. And this is something I like to point out to people about the Pharisees. Uh, we, have, we have heard in sermons and in, read in books and, and even just in the way that things are portrayed or the way we read things into the text, we have come to equate Pharisees not only with being bad guys, but we call anybody that is seemingly self-righteous, holier than thou, what do we call them? 
a Pharisee. Oh, that guy over there is just a Pharisee. Well, here's the thing about Pharisees. The Pharisees were a, uh, were a part of the Jewish leadership in, in a subset of Judaism where they had specific theological convictions and beliefs and a system of religion that they, uh, you know, attempted to live up to. And they cared enough about their people to try to have the people that belonged to their group and that worshiped in their synagogues to stay on the right path to God. And so, you know, because we're so used to vilifying the Pharisees, we often read, well, Jesus is the good guy of the story, so, and they're the ones that seem to have a problem. That means everything they say and do not only is bad, but then we jump to the conclusion that everything that they say and do must have bad intentions as well. And I would like to challenge that notion that the Pharisees had bad intentions all the time. Uh, now, of course, Luke uh, makes a pretty difficult statement about them saying uh, the Pharisees who what? loved money. I mean, uh, yeah, that's not exactly something that people want to have uh, to their credit. But nevertheless, um, Luke even could have been talking about these specific Pharisees and not all Pharisees. We, we know, for instance, that, uh, that, that Paul um, is a Pharisee of Pharisees. He calls himself that in his stuff or in his writings and um, that he's got zeal for God. And the reason it's important to point that out is because he doesn't say, I was a Pharisee and now I'm a Christian. He says, uh, I am this and I'm also a follower of Jesus saved by grace. And so he doesn't drop his, uh, his belonging to this Jewish group. He just believes the Messiah he waited for has been found, even though he was a knucklehead and persecuted the church, which knucklehead is a lighthearted thing to call someone that was uh, imprisoning and murdering them. But nevertheless, God saved him on the road to Damascus. But the point is, is that we often, we often have this view of Pharisees that is overgeneralizing and, and, and putting them into a, a tight-knit box. And so, because the Pharisees' intentions weren't always bad, and because like they had a religious system they cared about, and because the Jewish people that followed them as leaders cared about keeping up with that religious system, they thought the Pharisees were the good guys. And here's this rabbi named Jesus teaching them this stuff and poking and prodding at their religious leaders. And, you know, I don't know if any of you all, or maybe you at home, <laughs> uh, I don't know if you all have ever, uh, you know, had someone that you look up to maybe revere and someone said a, an unkind word or even a criticism about them, you immediately want to go, go to bat for them because they're your person, you know, you, you think highly of them. And so that's no different here. That's what's happening with the Pharisees. So it's possible, again, possible. We, we don't know because we're not told what the rest of the audience thought. But it's possible that because of Jesus getting uh, after it with the Pharisees uh, might have had a problem with Jesus uh, for saying these things that, at the very least, if not attacking them outright, seem to go against the things that they had in conflict with Jesus. And the last thing that we have here is that finally some of the crowd might not have understood the meaning of the parables altogether, which was typical even for Jesus' following, uh, closest followers. And we've made this point time and time again. Uh, people would hear Jesus' teaching, and we know the disciples in private would come to him and say, hey, Jesus, could you explain that to us? Because we didn't get it. And there's a high likelihood that a large crowd following Jesus were just completely perplexed as to why Jesus is telling this, this parable uh, in, in this manner. And then if you remember, so when we were setting up these questions last week, we always differentiate between uh, the, the initial audience of Jesus, meaning the people that were there with Jesus on the ground, listening to him as he spoke these words. And then we have what we call the gospel's audience, which could include either the same people that were around Jesus at that point, or at least people that knew those people as eyewitnesses. But nevertheless, since the gospels were written after the time of Jesus, um, 
it is uh, likely that some of those early witnesses weren't around anymore, and there were uh, new folks on the scene that were trying to follow Jesus. And so these Gospels are written uh, to help uh, them either form or continue on in their faith. So we always have to ask the question when we're reading a text, not only how Jesus' initial audience might have uh, thought about this parable, but also how the original audience that received these Gospels before they were canonized and put into one book we call the Bible, how might they have received uh, this, uh, this parable? And here what we've written in here is that the Gospels audience would be challenged when it comes to who they were willing to include in the church and who they were eager to disqualify And so the gospel here is critiquing Pharisaic Judaism and elevating Messianic Judaism, meaning Jewish people that follow Jesus, uh, insofar as that those who follow Jesus are willing to do anything and everything to include those left out by the former establishment. Now, I read this verbatim here for a reason. This statement here is the closest that we can get to really grasping the meaning of this parable and why Jesus would have used a dishonest manager as an exemplary figure in this situation. When you go back through the parable, the parable itself, um, and you see what Jesus has said about this guy, he he tells the, the debtor, you know, how much do you owe? And they give him a number and he says, ah, go quickly change it. Uh, make it less, you know. Now, what, what would the end result have been there? Well, if you owed, uh, you know, if you owned 900 uh, early on, you might not be able to pay that, but you might have 500. If you change it to 450, cut it in half, and now you can uh, do it. And not only that, um, they didn't live in an era of electronic records and carbon copies, <laughs> The same papyrus uh, that, that our uh, New Testament text, uh, you know, would have been written on originally, it would have been the same material sometimes that were used to write up receipts or uh, contractual agreements and things like that. So he kind of had one copy, and there was an honor system here, and if you're really good at it and capable, uh, you can go change the number on that and bring it back and say, here's what I owe you, and I've got proof right here. And what's the person going to do? They wrote that. That person went off days, maybe even months later, because it wasn't like you went and did the job that day in this culture. Things took time. People had distance, traveling distance. It would have been much easier to do what this dishonest uh, manager did than it would be today. You know, uh, if someone forges somebody else's writing. There's all sorts of people out there that can figure out that the handwriting's different, and you know, it's easy to see when whiteouts put on the paper and all this different stuff. Interesting fact: When I worked at a bank, you were not allowed to have whiteout anywhere near your desk. By the way, anyway, fun <laughs> banking fact. Uh, aside from that, huh? What was that? I said that's why I don't work. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, and it's just funny. Well, it's funny you think about that stuff, but uh, you know. I, anyway, uh, I'm like, I don't know how you wouldn't the way people could have detected that stuff uh, in security offices. But anyway, no white out of the bank. Anyway, they didn't have white out then either. So that's the point. So anyway, so what Jesus is establishing in this parable then is is the why. Why Why beyond helping this debtor and double-crossing this person that's going to, you know, fire them from the job? Why would this person do that? Well, Jesus tells us why one would do this. And first of all, it says that the master commended the dishonest manager because he'd acted shrewdly. So, Here's the, uh, the sh- there's many elements of shock to this story. So as we just established, there's a reason this would be easy to get away with in this culture. On the flip side of that, in Jesus' story, which Jesus gets to make up the story because he's the one telling it, somehow the master has figured out what the dishonest manager has done. And in a culture where that probably would not have ended well in real life for the dishonest manager, the master commends the dishonest manager for acting shrewdly. Like, 
It's kind of like, oh, I see what you did there. Huh? Bravo. Got to hand it to you. Apparently he gets away with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you, he'd have been thrown in prison and busted big time. But in Jesus' story, all is good with this guy. And then Jesus says, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than they are the people, uh, than are the people of the light. So the people of the light, who might Jesus have been talking about there? Well, okay, so we are thinking about the, the uh, so let's backtrack a bit. Who might he have been talking about to the initial audience standing around him hearing this? See, be- before the church kind of took off with the Holy Spirit and stuff, uh, we know that the term Christian didn't come along later. So who would he have been talking about that were light? They're just Jewish people in general, right? So what he's saying here is, for the people of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. So remember, and again, we'll look at these parables uh, next week, but Jesus has told parables about uh, lost things being found. And there are lost sheep of Israel that in Jesus' mind through his teaching and in his going back and forth with the Pharisees uh, have been uh, not only lost but overlooked and just forgotten and uncared for. Uh, by those of the light. You see what he's doing here? So he's basically saying, hey, people in the world around you that don't, that don't have what the people that descend from Israel have, we've got the, the scriptures and the, the, the truth about God, and the, this evil, vile world around here is more willing to act shrewd to gain in dealing with their own kind of people than the people of the light are with their own they're willing to lose and overlook those that they deem unimportant. And then he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That's interesting. What's he doing there? Well, remember in verse 14, right after this parable and after Jesus is done talking, we hear that the Pharisees are what? Lovers of money. Jesus is effectively saying, you should be as shrewd as this dishonest manager in going and forming friendships with your wealth, with other people, and caring for other people, and connecting with other people, than collecting wealth for yourself and forgetting about all of the lost sheep of Israel. Huh? Sharing? Well, I'd say it goes beyond sharing because, again, Jesus does use a dishonest manager as, as the commendable person in the story. He's saying, like, to go win people that you've deemed uh, unwinnable and unimportant, you should go to great lengths rather than keeping power and wealth for yourself, which is what he's accusing the Pharisees of doing with this parable. Yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a collection agency thing for those online, uh, and and the fact that this guy's helping them cut things in half, he's doing him a, a service, and that's the thing, because now when this guy needs help, he's helped out these people in a big way, and now he's won friends over by acting shrewdly, as the text says, uh, even though it wasn't his money to act shrewdly with. Uh, making him dishonest because he basically helped them perpetuate a lie here. And so the gospel's recipients receiving this parable in sequence with the other parables and with the whole of the story and the cost of discipleship is if the disciple of Jesus is meant to be willing to lose themselves to follow Jesus, to gain life, then the Pharisees are effectively uh, the antithesis to the disciple of Jesus. They seem more intent on gaining for themselves and willing to lose even the lost sheep of Israel, who, by the way, as religious leaders, 
They are meant to be caring for. Does that make sense? So the question is, uh, does this kind of go back to the, the, the differentiation between law and grace? Uh, kind of, the law of grace thing gets really, really murky uh, because we've made the word law bigger than it ought to be when we read those phrases in the New Testament. Jesus would never advocate for someone breaking uh, moral commands from the Bible. And so when we talk about the capital L law from the standpoint of, well, I've got Jesus so nothing else matters, that's not really an accurate representation. The deal with the law is, A, because we're all sinners, we can't be saved by our own merit, so merely living up to some of the law standards while failing at others isn't going to do the trick. Secondly, and this is more important, when in the New Testament we're uh, reading about uh, using the law as we've got the law and we uphold the law as our way toward salvation as opposed to the grace offered through Jesus, most of the time what's being referred to are the rights and customs that mark someone as uniquely Jewish. And the one that gets picked on by Paul, for instance, a lot is circumcision. Because that sort of outward sign sets them apart from the rest of the world. But the problem is, is that God had a plan to bring in Gentiles, non-Jewish people, into the fold, and they don't have the same mark that their fellow Jewish people do. And so they can't live up to the law because, well, they could, but most people aren't going to be interested in going after that particular custom if they're a Gentile. And so uh, they, they are already in trouble if it's a law-based system. But Jesus overcomes where we fail at the law. So it's not so much law in terms of are the Pharisees here being overly legalistic and, and Jesus is being more gracy and free-spirited. It's, it's more that, in reality, the Pharisees, by overlooking those in need around them and, and choosing who's worth their time and worth their effort and worth their cost, um, they should be the last ones to be doing that kind of choosing. They should know better. And Jesus is chastising them for for doing that. Some of them did. Some of them did. We don't know. We don't know that all of them do, but some of them did. But there's also, so I don't, I don't know why I might be going on a defense of the Pharisees tonight. I always end up finding myself in this position. <laughs> But the, the thing is about the Pharisees, though, too, is they were religious leaders in a very tumultuous uh, circumstance in their larger culture. Let's not forget that uh, the Jewish people had their religious leaders, but their religious leaders were not the ones in power. The Romans were. And so the, the Pharisees... Because the Romans were constantly picking on the Jewish people, and there was always little bands of Jewish people that really hated the Romans so much that they were going to go uh, commit all sorts of atrocities trying to throw them out. Uh, it, it's the case of the bad apple ruining the whole bunch in terms of the Ro the Romans are like, okay, if, if if I've got a room of uh, of a hundred Jewish people and two of them are bad apples we're going to go ahead and take it out on all 100 of them. So if you're a Pharisee at this time and you're trying to protect not only your system and maybe you have some selfish motive, but also you want to protect your people, you don't want them to go following some upstart would-be Messiah that might lead them to go get into cahoots, or not cahoots, into battle with the Romans and end up getting everybody decimated in the process. And that's why Jesus, that, that you know, we, we look at this like, like, man, 
Jesus just got under their skin, and then we find out the Pharisees are plotting to kill him. What's that about? That seems pretty harsh. But, uh, and the, the chief priest says this uh, in a kind of prophetic thing and uh, utterance in the Gospels, but he, you know, when they're contemplating arresting and, and trying Jesus, what does he say? It's better for one man to die than for the whole lot of us to die. Well, the reason he says that is he was right uh, because of God's plan that he wasn't in on, but on, an, on a worldly level and them trying to keep the Romans at bay, it's better that this upstart Messiah dies than for him to lead uh, his band of followers into a revolt and have them all slaughtered. And so that's what they're up against which makes Jesus actually kind of seem like a meanie guy <laughs> a little bit because he no doubt knows the circumstances they're in and yet he doesn't let them off the hook because Jesus knows that he's following the agenda of his father and not some murderous plot against the Romans. In fact, Jesus has a plan to actually save Romans themselves through his sacrifice. But the Pharisees, they don't want to hear any of it because they think their system's the right way, and they don't believe Jesus to be the Messiah that his followers are claiming him to be, and so they get into it with him. Sadly, they were wrong. But at least, at the very least, if I'm not defending the Pharisees, hopefully when we read these stories, maybe we can be a little bit of empathetic toward them, and at least understanding what they might be up against and how we could be in their shoes because it helps us understand the tension of these, these stories. And, and, and if you've ever thought like, I mean, I know Jesus is picking on them, but why are they going to those lengths? Well, that's why. It's not just because they're murderous, treacherous people that, you know, want to want to kill a guy because he told a weird story. <laughs> they, they, have, they have bigger things on their mind that they're concerned about in, in this moment. So, so that kind of bunches together how the gospel's recipients and how Jesus' original audience might have responded to the parable. But then, of course, we ask how would his original audience and the gospel's audience or recipients have been what convicted by the parable? What, what might have moved them toward change hearing this if they were in a position of understanding it? And the first one is that Jesus' audience might have been prompted to reconsider what their life goals and aspirations were all about. Remember, some of his group might have been not just pro-Pharisee, but they might have looked to the Pharisees as what they actually were to the people, religious leaders, you know? Like, I'm sorry if you all like ever look at me because I get up and teach Bible and say, you know, Maybe I should listen to what he's saying today and try to apply it to my life. Listen to the Bible, not me. But anyway, I, I, like, if you've ever listened to your preacher and actually trusted that they're teaching Scripture right and, and leading you that way, that's what the Pharisees were for these people. Yet, if they're convicted by this and they hear what Jesus said and maybe they thought about the way that things were actually unfolding in their life around them, Maybe they would have been prompted to reconsider and say, eh, maybe these Pharisees that we're following aren't exactly the right ones to follow. Maybe we should be following this Jesus fella here. He sounds pretty messianic. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know that they would have said it that way. Uh, rather than aspiring toward uh, perceived righteousness and then wealth of Pharisees. Oh, and I need to add this in about the wealth thing. Many of you have also probably heard the story of the rich young man that comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him to follow the commandments, and then he says to Jesus, uh, well, I've been doing that since I was a kid. And notice, and when you read that story, you'll notice Jesus doesn't say, no, you haven't, you're a liar. Jesus actually acknowledges, yeah, yeah, I actually have. So good on you. And then he says, but I want you to do one other thing. I want you to go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And his disciples, if you remember here, Jesus say this, and they're like, oh, if that guy's not in, we're in big trouble. Why would they have thought that? I mean, this guy walked away from Jesus, and they're following him, right? Well, the reason was is because, uh, and this is a little bit different than the health wealth gospel that we hear from big name televangelist preachers today. Uh, so I don't, yeah, Joel. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, and, and others like him. But this is a little bit different than that. Um, this wasn't a, um, a uh, if, if, you, if you 
subscribe to this idea or whatever, you're going to be made uh, wealthy and you're going to have your best life and all this stuff. What this was is that they had, they had a, a simple understanding most of the time that uh, if someone was downtrodden, down and out, afflicted with uh, poverty, disease, harm, whatever it is, sin must have been the root cause to get them in that state. And therefore, if sin was the root cause of someone being uh, on, on the down and out, then the opposing view to that would naturally be that if someone seems to be blessed, life is going well for them, uh, their, their grain is growing, their livestock is thriving, maybe they've got a lot of money, whatever it is, they must be doing the opposite of sinning. They must be following God in an obedient sense. It's, it's actually the, the, the notion of you reap what you sow, but taken to a very, very rigid black and white viewpoint. Now, we know in Scripture there are plenty of, of places, Ecclesiastes, even Jesus says this at one point, you know, uh, God causes the sun to, to rise on, on, on the good and the wicked, right? So we know that this idea that formulated within some sets of Judaism uh, isn't uh, aligning with all of the totality of Scripture, but we do see a lot in Scripture where God outright tells the Israelites, Things are going to go your way if you obey my commands, and if you don't, guess what's going to happen? You're going into exile, and we know how that story ends in the Old Testament. They end up in exile. So the reason I say is we can understand why that thought process that sin must be the cause of downtroddenness and, and wealth and thriving must be a sign of obedience, okay? So if you have that viewpoint as a Jewish person— and a rich guy comes to Jesus, and then you hear Jesus acknowledge, yeah, you have kept the commands. That guy must be righteous, and his wealth is a sign of his uh, upright standing before God. And then Jesus has to open his mouth again and say, but I got one more thing for you. All that sign of your obedience to me, go sell it and get rid of it, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And his disciples are like, but we thought he was one of the good ones, and he's walking away sad. I tell you that to say that when we read a comment from Luke that the Pharisees loved money, if money was a sign of obedience before God, and they were leaders of the people of God, the people probably also thought the wealth of the Pharisees was a sign of their uprightness and good standing before God. And therefore, that would have really made this parable shocking to them that Jesus is challenging them that wealth should not be an aspirational goal, but instead you should use any means necessary to go win over people rather than win wealth for yourself. Now, of course, the system can be manipulated. Uh, you could do all sorts of crooked things to gain wealth, but if all of the followers of Judaism think that wealth is a sign of your righteousness, well, all you got to do is put on a nice shiny hat and a nice shiny robe, and voila, you must be a good, obedient follower to God, even if you are acting treacherously, which is why the money thing becomes problematic because it very easily can dress up our perception of people. And we know this even to be true in our celebrity culture today, regardless of wealth, you know, someone looks clean cut, they're good looking, they got a nice suit, they keep themselves in tip top shape. We've never met them in our lives and heard them speak two words other than the lines that they recite in the movie, but for some reason we must assume that they are a good upright citizen. And then of course we find out later on 10 years that they did some horrible thing five years before that. And then we see their fall and, and all that. And the reality is, is that we probably should have never assumed the best about them in that regard from the first place. Now, we shouldn't assume the worst about people. We should just assume that they're people like everyone else, sinners like the rest of us are. But we do that as a culture even today. We, we, think, we think things about people, um, you know, and then when something happens, oh, I always thought that was a good guy. It kind of shocks me that that happened. Or, you know, even on the news, you know, then the neighbor does something really bad and then they interview the next door neighbor. Oh, you always seem like a good guy to me. 
I didn't know he had going on in his house, you know? So we do this. We're all accustomed to doing this. We can all be duped into doing this. So again, I also want us to make sure we're not looking at all of the Jewish people that are following the Pharisees and thinking, ah, oh, you idiots, you should have known better. We wouldn't have known any better either. Jesus' disciples didn't always get it, and we probably wouldn't have either. So again, coming back to how might they have been convicted, well, it might have caused them to change what they aspire after and instead to value people who have what? Eternal significance. Jesus adds that in when he talks about winning over people, uh, over wealth, which is temporary. So people have eternal significance. You win someone to the Lord, uh, they don't just start getting made right in the here and now. They keep getting made right, and then they get to be right with God for the rest of their lives and all of eternity. That's something worth winning over, over wealth that gets buried in the ground or burned up when you die. <laughs> this is not worth it. So Jesus is challenging, uh, you know, what they aspire to in that. Um, and I notice here uh, that in ver- or we note here in verse eight that uh, uh, that it challenges people to be clever in how they form relationships instead of how they accumulate wealth, and that that's a key thing, right? Because you know people will find any trick in the book to you know uh, did I check the stocks correctly today to see if I gain more? Or, oh, you know if I if I go get this side job over here, I can. I can amass $10,000 more a year or something like that. We do all these things, but we don't actually make the same effort in going and fostering relationships with people that have eternal significance, which is why Jesus uses this crazy story of a dishonest manager as a commendable figure, because the guy, while he does something that you shouldn't do, which is lying on a document like that, his intent behind it is to win over people rather than get money for himself, which is the whole point there. So, and then we go to the gospel recipients. How might they have been convicted by the parable? Well, the gospel recipients would have been convicted in a similar way to Jesus' original audience. But in addition to that, they would be compelled to give of their possessions for the greater good of the church and those who the church sought to save. So uh, notice that the aspiration of gaining wealth is considered a vice, but wealth in and of itself isn't. That's a quote we ruin a lot as a, a, a culture. How many have heard, heard the misused or the misrendered quote, money is the root of all evil? That's not what Jesus says, is it? The love of money is the root of all evil. So money is amoral. It's not a vice. It's not a virtue. It's a, it's a, it's a resource to be used uh, for good. It's a resource that can be used for bad. It, can, uh, it could put food in our stomach, and it can also buy a yacht. (laughs) But it's just money. But the thing is, we know that in the book of Acts, and by the way, the the gospel of Luke, the writer Luke, is the one that also wrote the book of Acts. So you know he's not just writing this gospel, he's thinking forward to the church. So he's setting up not only the story of Jesus, but going to connect the early church. And we know in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4, we get this portrait of the church where one of the hallmarks is that they take the proceeds of, of all that they've earned and what they do what with it? They lay it at the apostles' feet. And what does it say? Nobody within the community was at without need. So, by the way, the apostles weren't just pocketing all themselves either. Uh, people's needs were being met. Things were being dis- distributed and things like that. And, and not only that, so this is key here too. If you live in this world where the rich top percentage of the culture was a very minority people group and everyone else was pretty much poverty stricken, there wasn't much of a middle class in this culture. And suddenly you see this community of Jesus followers where everyone's taking care of each other. People don't go without need. They're treating each other like what? Brothers and sisters even though they're not blood family? You think, I might want in on that. And so now, what is the early church doing when they bring money to the apostles' feet and spreading it amongst themselves so everyone whose needs are met? Uh, They're winning people on the outside over with their wealth rather than keeping their wealth for themselves. So the church ends up embodying this very parable. Now, why do I point this out? Well, because as I established, the original uh, recipients of this letter, when it was written 30, 40, 50, however many years after Jesus ascended to heaven, 
uh, would have been part of a community living this out. And so this parable then ends up encouraging them to continue on using their wealth in this godly way and for this godly intention, as opposed to going back to the old system of belief that thought, well, this wealth should be mine because it's a sign of God's blessing and my obedience to God. I now have a different understanding of the meaning of wealth and how it can be used for for good in the kingdom. And so that's how they might have been convicted. And so as we said last week, and as we'll continue to do with all these um, into next week, what lessons can we draw from this parable? It's all well and good to talk about what Jesus' audience might have thought. It's all good and well to think about what the gospel recipients might have thought and, and so on. But what lessons can we draw from this parable and how can we apply them to our lives? And the first one is this, and I've kind of alluded to this multiple times, but the person's behavior in a parable isn't necessarily meant to be copied directly, but rather viewed as a part of a more significant lesson. I don't think anyone in this room or any of you online at home are thinking this, but just in case anybody is, Jesus is not suggesting that you go find a document, fudge the numbers in order to make your friend more well off so that they'll be your bud, you know? That's not what he's doing here. So if you got that out of the story, take that from your mind. What he is doing, though, is he's using an outrageous type of figure and an outrageous circumstance that's still rooted in reality to make a more significant lesson, and that is that our life shouldn't be about the attaining of wealth, but the attaining of people and winning them over because people have eternal significance and value to God, and money uh, in the eternal uh, scope of things means nothing. So the actions of the shrewd manager illustrate God's concern for people over wealth. In light of that, this parable challenges us to change our own priorities, aligning them more closely to God's. And so, you know, with that, um, you know, hopefully we're, we're seeing this story and, uh, and, and we're thinking to ourselves, you know, uh, in my life and given my situation and the people around me, how can I embody this, this idea that Jesus is bringing forth? And actually, before you even get to how can I embody this in my own life, we might want to ask, are there ways I should be being convicted by this parable that maybe I've been overlooking here? Because here's the thing, and this is why I always try to like uh, go to bat for the Pharisees a little bit, because if you read this story with the view that the Pharisees are the most horrible people ever to exist in the whole world, then guess what you get to do? You can read this parable and say, well, clearly Jesus was teaching this about the parable or about the Pharisees, and they're the ones that got mad, and I follow Jesus, so uh, I'm fine. This has nothing to do with me. And that's not really a good way to read this, because that actually doesn't make you uh, more righteous than the Pharisees. Uh, that makes you as uh, lacking in humility as they might be being portrayed in the story. Uh, the truth is, is that probably all of us, especially in our uh, uh, blessed, wealthy nation, uh, although we all have uh, different degrees of things and we all have different degrees of issues and problems in life, most of us have been born and raised on the notion of the American dream, and often at the core of that American dream is the desire to attain wealth and uh, a better footing for yourself, and, and, and hopefully maybe uh, on a positive sense at least, of it, a, a better footing for your loved ones, you know. Uh, again, I don't, I don't like overgeneralizing and then saying all of us that go after the American dream and want to have a nice this and a nice that. We're all horrible people. Uh, many of us want to just simply make things better for our own children and our children's children, and that actually is quite biblical. Uh, in fact, Jesus chastises his, uh, the Pharisees one time uh, because uh, they tell people that are supposed to be taking care financially of their loved ones uh, that they should mark their money as what he says, Corbin, which means it's dedicated to God. And he's like, you want to know how to dedicate your money to God? How about you take care of your ailing parents? That's a good way to do it. 
Now, of course, give to the temple. Of course, church, bring the money to the apostles' feet and take care of the community. But your community includes your own family, you know? If you're driving a hot rod car and your kid is starving, you have missed the point. So, we want to think about how this impacts us, challenges us, convicts us. The manager was clever and took risks to build relationships. We should put forth effort as well when we bond with others. And again, this is not only the priority thing, you know, our life shouldn't be about what we attain, but maybe who we attain. Um, but, but beyond that is just the, um, you know, man, we, we fill our lives up with to-dos and projects and gains and spend very little time with even those closest to us these days, you know? Um, let alone people sitting next to you in your church or the people that aren't even in this church yet. And I think maybe we should probably read this parable and rethink our priorities in that regard and be more open to people. And then the last bullet point that we have here is that in light of the larger context of Jesus explaining the cost of discipleship, we learn that we should be willing to give things up if it means carrying out his mission of saving the lost. And that's the key thing here, you know, um, because uh, in order to uh, in order to follow Jesus, uh, it may mean it may mean giving up something that uh, that we're addicted to or st- stuck doing, or um, it might mean challenging things we assume are good that might not be according to Jesus, and it definitely means uh, caring for others even at our own cost. Um, in whatever ways, practically speaking, that that looks in your own in your own life, and so for this parable that is weird, and we're like, why would Jesus use that person that way? Well, if we get past the weirdness and we don't completely vilify the Pharisees so that we can get off scot free, there's actually a lot Jesus is saying with this parable, and the biggest point of all of them is that. Um, Jesus cares about winning people over, and they have eternal significance to God. And the people of God should share that same level of significance, or that view of significance of people that God has, rather than overlooking them to get their own gain. And Jesus just happens to use a dishonest manager who got really good at changing uh, uh, contracts uh, to help win some people over. And that's that parable. So, anybody have any questions about this or anything that comes up from this parable? We we finished three minutes before eight. We've been going past eight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Shrewd is a uh, an interesting word. Um, we might, we might, yeah, we might have a, well, because we might think of it from the negative side of maybe uh, conniving or something like that. But you could also think of the word shrewd from the same, and by the way, again, this is an English word being used here for uh, something Greek, so it could have a range of different meanings, but the, it's a good word for the concept. But shrewd can have a, uh, can have a more positive expression of it. And maybe the best way that I'm thinking is, uh, My wife's birthday is coming up in a couple days. So, you know, what you got to do when you want a gift for somebody. And I've told several of you several times, gift giving is uh, the lowest scoring of my love language indicator. I've taken that test twice and I score a zero on it. Uh, So if I have any gift giving prowess at all, I have told Angie, I'm using it on two people and it's Angie and Leo. I will do all of my other love language things for you all, but sorry, I just don't, I'm not the person that's in, in, the, uh, in the store randomly and says, you know, that looks good for Dave right there. I remember he said this thing one time, and I bet he'd really like that, you know? Uh, I just, it doesn't, it doesn't click. In fact, gift giving, I stress about that. Like, 
oh my gosh, they're going to think I'm so stupid. This gift is horrible. I, I wish I wasn't even doing this right now. I don't want a gift from them because then I feel like I have to give something back and then I've got to fear. That's how I feel about you. It just causes all sorts of anxiety for me. Nevertheless, one of the two people will have a birthday <laughs> that I make that extra effort for. And what do we do when we're going to get a gift for someone? Well, we, we listen to them. We figure out what they might want or need. And then, of course, we've got to figure out how to like, not have them find out what you got them. And I'm not going to say because this is online. Uh, but um, but you got to figure it out. And then you got to figure out how to get it because it's your spouse and share an account. And they could easily see that you did. So you got all this stuff. So I had to act shrewdly. And that's a way to what, when, when in this case, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, Angie likes me a little extra for the day because I was thoughtful and figured something out she would like. But the point is, is I've acted shrewdly uh, for, for people. And we, we do those things in, in different circumstances in life. So that could be a positive aspect of this. And, and so... Um, you know, and I've seen people in the church do that. Anytime I've, I've been the recipient of this before. Anytime I've ever seen a story or experienced a story of someone anonymously giving something that you needed and then suddenly a generous uh, fellow church member uh, ends up, you know, on your doorstep or your, your wherever it is. And you've got a note. I got one one time. Uh, it got someone got to someone that I had had recent car trouble or whatever. And I, two weeks later, I came into my office and there was an envelope with some money in it. And they said, just wanted you to know, we love you. Thanks to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And they didn't say who it was. Which in that moment, I did want to be able to pay them back. And I was very mad. I never found out who it was. I tried so hard. I kept asking everyone. I was like, I don't care. And I have... They have good friends that wouldn't spill the beans anyway, but nevertheless, the point is, so that can be a, a way of, of shrewdness in that sense. I know, I know. That is, you know what? My good buddy A.A. Ron said the exact same thing to me, so um, yeah, so yeah. There you go. So, uh, so repeat that for us again, just in case we. So it's sharp, having shown sharp, sharp powers of judgment or astute. That's that is the textbook definition for those of you online didn't hear in the room um, of of shrewd. So, so hopefully, yeah, you have a positive view of the word shrewd now, and instead of the more uh, kind of cunning. Uh, devious variety of it. Anything stand out for you or any other questions that come up uh, for you tonight? Well, also, I was thinking mm -hmm. this guy's asking him to pay less because he knows he's going to need something. He's going to go to them to get it. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that could be. Jesus doesn't really get... Unfortunately, I always try to psychoanalyze Jesus' parable characters, and it's not a good thing to do. Uh, like, I wonder what he was really thinking of doing. It's not even a real person, but I'm going to get inside this guy's head. I think the idea was is that, that they're going to know that he helped them out. And it's, it's kind of a, they got a wink, wink sort of situation between them. It still baffles me that Jesus decides to turn the story and say that the master figured it out anyway and commends it. That's, that's the thing that always blows me away. Like, I'm really falling with you, Jesus. I get what you're doing. Even this guy's being shrewd and all. And then the master commends us that that would never, ever happen in this world, ever. I mean, you, <laughs> no. So anyway, yeah, so that's the story. Well, thank you all. I hope you'll come back because, as I said at the beginning, we're going to go back in Luke uh, to the uh, parable of the prodigal son. Here's fun fact, and this didn't get planned at all when we were planning, but God does cool and funny things. Guess what passage Didi's going to be preaching on on Sunday? Yep. So uh, we'll get a double dose of it next week. So hear it on Sunday, and then we'll dive deeper into it on, on Thursday. Huh? We'll, we'll, yeah, 
No, 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 no. It'll, uh, it'll be, uh, it'll be, uh, it'll be awesome. I like digging deep into this. Thank you for following us, and uh, thank you all for being here with us tonight. So, have a